right, uh, hi everyone, my name is Alexander, and I'm here to talk about the rendering of Memories You Told, or how to be Bob Ross with shaders, I guess. Before we start, um, I'd like you to cancel, uh, to silence your cell phones, and to remember to uh, fill out the evaluation forms after the talk. So, before we start talking about the uh, Memories You Told, I am going to talk a little bit about myself. Uh, I feel very weird giving a graphics talk because I am actually quite sight impaired. I only have 16% uh, eyesight. Um, it's specifically because of this gene right here. And I know that because they actually used a gene uh, sample from me when I was one as part of the Human Genome Project. So um, I guess you're all welcome for that scientific discovery. <laughs> um, and you might be wondering, why do I end up making games, which is such a visual medium, instead of like continuing on this very promising uh, career in genetics I, I had started so early? And it is kind of ironic, but for me, I've always been attracted to video games because they're these constructed environments that are meant to be traversed and be discovered and read at a glance. When um, a good level designer makes a level, they will use something called a squint test, where they will blur their vision and see if the level is still legible. I can't stop squint test. I do it all the time, and let me tell you, reality doesn't hold up to it. So having uh, games where the environment has actually been designed to be legible, um, I, it's not so weird I ended up doing this. More specifically, with um, Painterly aesthetics and something that's not trying to be photorealistic, quite often it's a lot easier to read because you, artists are thinking much more about like the, the base shape of the objects and you don't have like um, all the like noise of the real uh, life coming in the way. So for example, playing a game like uh, The Return of the Opera Din was something I really enjoyed because everything had clear uh, outlines and um, was easy to, to tell apart. So when I got the chance to work on 11.11, I, I jumped at it. Um, it's a narrative game set in the First World War, and it tells the story from uh, both uh, the German and uh, the Allied side. It's a co-production between Art and Animations, uh, DigixArt, and it's published by uh, Bandai Namco. Team size was around 30, and the team was distributed all around the world. I think that's like a talk in itself, how we, we managed to do that. Uh, we used Unity uh, 17.3 uh, with a modified uh, legacy deferred renderer. And development time was approximately um, three months of, uh, oh, sorry, six months of pre production and 10 months of, uh, of full production. And um, the game was released in November uh, to commemorate the centennial of the armistice, and hence the name. Um, as you can see, we kind of have the release date in the name of the game, so we could not afford any delays. Uh, so that was a very interesting experience, but we managed to do it in the end. Oh, in case you haven't seen the game, I'm gonna show you the trailer so you can get a sense of how this uh, painterly art style looks. Let's see if I can zoom in here. The first time you see someone die, everything shuts down. You're left with thoughts that go round and round. Every man has his demons. I did what any father would do. And I would make the same choices again. 
that music always gets me. All right, so here is the outline of uh, the talk. I'm first gonna give you an overview of how the Painterly uh, render pipeline works. And I'm then gonna go over some challenges and uh, snazzy features that uh, is in it. After that, I'm gonna show you how the artist uh, used the pipeline. And following that is optimization of it. And then at the end, I'm gonna have a very short um, section on the future improvements. And at the end, there will also be some time for questions. So, um, all these interstitials you're gonna see like throughout the talk are actually like the concept that we were like working towards. So that should give you an idea of like where we, where we were at the start and where we ended up. So, whenever I start on a new project and I have to develop new, new tech for it, I look at existing white papers. Specifically when you're doing graphics programming, if you find papers that are kind of old, uh, it means that they're, qui they're quite likely to be um, something you can actually achieve uh, like for a commercial project now because you're also gonna make sure that you have enough headroom for the rest of the rendering taking place. Thankfully, I found these two uh, papers um, that are both using particles to approximate the uh, brush strokes so you get this painterly look. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, there we go. Okay, there we go. So um, what you see here is two papers that are, uh, one is uh, completely object-based and the other one is working uh, full screen, especially the one on the right, showed us that this is actually an, an approach that could work. And the way that it works in the game is we have the base frame, the base uh, frame buffer, and on top of that we paint uh, all these particles and then they are combined together. The first um, innovation we did was just painting these particles on top of the, the frame buffer. Already it meant that it looked um, a lot better than what had been done before because we could like close all the, the gaps in the particles. And um, uh, it kind of resembles how if you're using a camera obscura, like you are, you're basically taking a picture and then you're painting the strokes on top of it. On the technical side, all of this is based on uh, a technique developed by Garrett Thomas from uh, AMD. Um, it's all uh, based on compute, and it's a tile-based approach. I will only do a very quick uh, overview of how it works because uh, like he took a whole uh, talk explaining uh, more in more detail uh, how each step is uh, put together. Um, but his slides are readily available on the vault if uh, you need to check them up. And there's also a Git repository. Right, so this is how a frame is uh, constructed. We first have the regular frame buffer rendering, and together with that, we also render a specific uh, brush buffer that contains extra information for the uh, effect to place the brush strokes. After that, uh, we do uh, bloom and ambient occlusion, and after that, we start the actual rendering. Sorry, my notes are... This? Nope. Uh, so we generate new strokes, and after that we update uh, the strokes that are currently on the screen. Some of them are deleted and will die out. Yes, there we go. And then we end with um, uh, calling and coarse calling. Um, all of this is basically to make the rendering of the strokes uh, more efficient um, at the end. And we also do blend, uh, blending with uh, the background image as part of the brush stroke rendering. And when all of that is done, we have uh, the color grading and tone mapping. This is the different uh, aspects that the artists have control over. And what you're seeing here is the different uh, debug views that they have. So they can control the size of the brush strokes, if the brush strokes should boil, and if they should flow. If they boil, they basically die out quicker, so you get something that kind of shimmers. Um, it's really good for interactive objects in the game, something that you need to stand out. Since this game is about the First World War, a lot of uh, 
the levels take place in the trenches and they're like really wet and muddy, so we needed to show something that was like running with water. And that means that the artist can actually go in and say like, I want this, uh, the strokes to flow along the surface. And they flow along the direction that, uh, directors, uh, that the artists have also uh, instructed the effect to, to use. Something that is uh, also quite unique is that we can actually select what brush stroke we should render with. So that way you can have something that approximates like a very dry brush being kind of like dapped onto the canvas, but you can also have something that's much more wet and like long, longer. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility for the artist to use there. This is the format of the brush buffer. So size, flow speed, and angle each get a full eight bits because we need as much precision there as we can get. Um, for brush type, I'm only using uh, six bits, and then I have uh, two bits left for, for boil speed. Um, the reason for this layout was predominantly that we had to integrate this uh, into the, the deferred buffer, and uh, gamma correction caused some of these values to be kind of wonky, so it had to be laid out this way. So an early challenge was to make sure that the brush strokes would actually be aligned with the objects. And that's both, uh, they have to respect the object's own orientation, as, as you see with the magenta arrows. And they also had to, um, to work with uh, perspective uh, distortion. And it took me a while to figure this out, but what I ended up doing was that I would take uh, both the current fragment's uh, position in world space into the fragment shader, along with um, the world tangent and cotangent, and that way I could generate an offset point and take both of them um, into screen space and get a direction uh, vector, and then take the, get the radians from that and then store that uh, as a normalized radian into the brush map. This all sounds kind of expensive, and yeah, I was using a, an ATAN uh, tool for, for that, but it turned out to not be that big of an issue um, as we're gonna cover later in the optimization step. There we go. So, when new strokes are created, it, it happens in a kernel that takes the whole uh, screen and for each pixel generates a random number. Then for, um, to modify this spawn chance, we look at the current uh, uh, brush size we want here and the flow speed along with the boil speed and also the alpha coverage of the strokes that are already there. So if we don't have a good amount of coverage, we want to create more brush strokes. And all of those numbers are added together, and if there are more than one, a brush stroke is created. And that is by taking a, an index from an, uh, a consume buffer and use that to index into all the uh, data arrays um, that contains all the information for the strokes. So it's important that uh, RNG is very uniform. Um, to start with, I was using a noise texture, and I kept getting strokes planted on top of each other, which was a both it didn't look good and it was also not very performant. So at the end I used um, uh, WangHash, uh, which Cab uh, Cabby Games uh, covers in the render talk uh, on below. It's very easy to implement and it is producing some very nice noise. So I can recommend using that. So after the strokes are created, we move on to updating all the strokes that are already on the screen. The first thing is that the precision is updated and then we get the depth and color from the G buffer. We also get the brush type, flow speed, boil speed, and size from the brush map buffer. And if the surface is flowing or boiling, the stroke will die out faster in this, um, in, when we are applying the, the lifetime to the stroke. Um, a stroke is removed, that is its index is added back to the consume buffer from before, um, if its alpha hits uh, zero. So in order to make the effect not look uh, like you're watching it through uh, as a screen door, it's quite important that it moves with the scene underneath. So what you're seeing uh, here is, two, uh, is the same scene, but where on one hand they are, they, are, they are completely static, they don't follow the scene. On the right side, they are using motion vectors to move along. And especially if you're looking at the door frame, you can clearly see that there's a lot of uh, flickering going on. Um, if you don't do this. Thankfully, in Unity, 
you can just say, I want motion vectors, and you get them, and they turn out to be of a pretty good quality. Next step is coarse culling. This uh, happens with the box-box intersection, and testing revealed that 16 by 8 culling tiles was the, was the most efficient number. When a, um, collection, a con, uh, collision is detected, um, the strokes index is added to that tile's uh, index buffer. And a very similar approach is used for the next step, the fine culling. Uh, here, each tile is 32 by 32 pixels. It's again a box-box intersection testing, but when we're done with that, we also do a step of bitonic uh, sorting based on the depth of the particles um, to get correct alpha blending later on. And the bitonic sort is the same that Garrett Thomas used in uh, his talk. So the render kernel is what really is the most different from, uh, from Garrett's approach. It's, um, it starts by taking, um, uh, loading, by loading all the stroke data into LDS, um, so it's faster to retrieve. We then set the accumulated color to, uh, to zero, and we then, for each thread, uh, takes care of, of one pixel. We loop through the particles, and it's essentially a ray cast through them. So if the ray hits the stroke, we, also, we sample its, um, its uh, stroke texture and combines it with the stroke's color and add it to the accumulated color. By using a custom alpha blend, we can actually go uh, front to back instead of back to front. We didn't see much of an improvement in Garrett Thomas's talk. He, see, he sees a huge performance boost from this, but it's mainly just because he's actually doing particles in uh, world space and he shows that you can go very close to them. Um, and then I just left it in because it wasn't hurting performance either. All of this is uh, rendered into an HDR-ready uh, back buffer, uh, so we avoid banding. And the alpha value stored here is what, can, um, is, what is used in the generation kernel to determine how much coverage we have. So, uh, strokes are stored in an alpha-8 uh, 2K texture. Um, we found out that distinctive strokes are actually way more important uh, than like quite diffuse and soft. I personally thought that, that was actually going to work better, um, and turned out I was completely wrong. And different sprites give, uh, give impression of different surfaces. So, for example, for wood, we ended up using quite long and hard strokes, and then for the cat in the game, we had some that were like much more like hairy and, and, and bristly. Right, so let's cover some snazzy features. Early on, the biggest issue we had with, um, with the effect was readability, which shouldn't really come as a surprise, I guess. Uh, what you're seeing here is actually a screenshot from uh, the vertical slice a couple of uh, months into production, and it, this was a bit of a crisis moment, because if we couldn't get this to work, we would have to abandon the the, the Paisley effect and do something completely different. You might not be able to see it, but there's actually a man crouching on the ground. Um, so this amount of, of yeah, blurriness, um, it, that just wouldn't work. For the, um, for the vertical slice, what we ended up doing was just increasing the amount of particles, so they would approximate the shape of uh, the scene more. But for the uh, like full release, um, this didn't look that great, and it also wasn't performance, so we had to find out a different way to do it. So, the reason why this happens is that we're, we're painting all the strokes on top of the background image. And that basically means that if you have a stroke that is like from the background, it's still gonna cover like uh, uh, something that is in the foreground, such as uh, Kurt's arm here that's being obscured by the particles from the seep uh, uh, behind him. So uh, the trick was to sample the depth buffer in the render kernel so we know what is the, the, the absolute depth we should traverse through when we go through all our particles. So we get like all the particles that are belonging to Kurt's arm, but we stop um, when we know that the particles that are behind, behind him um, yeah, would, would just lead to like uh, covering up the... Uh, 
what's in the foreground. So this works, but you see that we get these like quite hard edges on objects, which is not painful at all. And in order to fix that, we end up blurring the background with a Kawase filter. And the reason why I ended up using this is because it's quite performant. It takes a little bit of uh, like uh, manual tweaking. So what you do is at each step, you sample out in a cross um, of four samples. And if you use uh, bilinear sampling, you end up with uh, double the amount. Um, so it's quite easy to, to use. It does require a little bit of like manual tweaking, so you don't get like the banding artifacts uh, you might be able to see in the projector. Um, but yeah, I recommend using it. Something that was also uh, important was that objects would have the correct uh, size of strokes attached to them. So if something recedes into the background and it's important that it's still legible, we need the strokes on them to be smaller. And that was quite easy by just uh, taking the depth of um, uh, in the fr in the fragment uh, shader and um, use that to increase the brush size. Interestingly enough, we actually ended up having this something that the artist could uh, control with a modifier, and they would sometimes use it in reverse. So if you have something where you want to guide the, the, uh, the eye of the player, this is like a technique that's also used in, in regular painting where you will use detail where you want the, the viewer to look. And this meant that we could actually con like get, get something kind of similar in an interactive environment, which I think is pretty cool. It also had to take in the camera's uh, field of view. So in the, in the game, one of the characters has a, a camera um, and can take pictures. And in order to have zooming, we changed the camera's FOV. And it's not really because you have like a different distance to the object, but like this, they can still be like smaller or bigger on the screen. And I fixed that by just having um, a curve for the artist to, to tweak where this would be added in based on the current FOV of the camera. Early on, it was all about getting as many strokes on the screen as possible. Like we thought that like this is how we're gonna make it look look really good. Like so we had around two million strokes at the end of the vertical slice. But sort of like halfway through development, we started to realize actually it's better if there's fewer because they look quite artificial if they're like placed like right next to each other. Um, it looks like this like manic robot has been like, ah, I need to, to paint this as good as possible. So for longer strokes, because they, are all, they have, will have the same height as uh, short strokes, they will cover a large area. So we need fewer of them. And I basically just took that into account when generating the, the random probability of them spawning. And it has, this had the, the added benefit that it looked better but we would also get better performance because there was fewer brush strokes on the screen. So for example here, if you look at the image to the right, uh, the beams look a lot more painterly and, um, and human made um, because there's fewer strokes on them. The second artist problem to solve was flickering. So the strokes kind of act as a, as a downsampling of the, the base frame buffer and this, this causes the, the scene to be, uh, become like very noisy um, when you're moving the camera around and when objects are moving. And the solution to this was to uh, sample the color of the brush stroke in a cross so we wouldn't just use the, the, the center of the stroke, but we would also look around it. Um, here I would actually use the, the brush type as well to basically do a bit of rejection sampling. So you kind of want the stroke to be colored by only the object that it's supposed to represent, but we don't have that data available, but there's a good chance that it's, it's only gonna be the object itself that has the exact same brush type, um, so it's like something in the, in the background is likely gonna be, be using something else. So that's like a cheap uh, and quick way to, uh, to kind of fake that. We also found out that the motion vectors from Unity are a little bit uh, like noisy. So even when nothing is moving, there would be a little bit of, of like drift. So by ap applying a simple threshold, that also took care of that. So the camera would have to actually be in motion or an object would have to be in motion before uh, you would start to have um, the stroke changing shape. Oh, sorry, changing color. 
So in the real world, when you're looking at a painting, you can actually pick out the individual brush strokes. That's because the, each stroke will catch the light a little bit differently because of the inherent impasto. Of course, we can't actually do, um, like do that um, because we don't know the lighting <laughs> conditions of uh, each player's uh, room that they're playing in. But we can approximate it. And that's simply by randomizing the color. And also by randomizing the angle, we actually get something that looks a lot more like handcrafted. And it's also kind of like part of the, the pointillism, um, which is part of, of impressionism that in, inspired this whole art style to begin with. So the way that this randomization is done is um, I tried to first use uh, HSV, but I got a lot of uh, like flickery and, and edge cases where, where it wouldn't work. So in the end, I had to come up with something where, because every, all the other colors was in RGB, like the randomization of them also had to be in RGB. And by looking at the color space, uh, like the RGB color cube, you can actually see that you, if you look at it from the right direction, it kind of resembles HSV anyways. So if you take a vector that goes from, uh, from like pure black to pure white and use that to form an orthonormal uh, set of basis vectors, you can actually use those to add uh, color randomization. It's by no means perfect, but it's good enough for like the small amount that, that we needed, and it turned to also be much more efficient because we didn't have to do the conversion uh, to HSV and back again. So we had to keep the randomization that was happening to each stroke constant from frame to frame, otherwise the stroke would keep changing color. And the only constant set of information I had for the stroke was actually its index. So I wrote this function you see here where I get a, a, like a pseudo-randomized uh, like, um, value out that is then used to apply all of um, these offsets. So this is some of my, my favorite features. We can um, actually um, handle particles in two different ways. Um, so one is just using an alpha cutout standard uh, particle shader that writes into the brush buffer. Uh, the good thing about this is that it's a workflow that the artists are familiar with, and it also allows the strokes to be lit. So you can see we're using that for fire quite a lot. We can also inject shuriken particles Unity's uh, particle system directly into the effect, so they appear as brush strokes. And I thought, personally, we were gonna use this everywhere because it's damn cool, but unfortunately, um, in the Unity's uh, deferred renderer, you can't actually access the lighting data, um, so they, they required a lot of like artist tweaking in order to sit well with the scene, so in then we only used them in like very like rare circumstances, and most of the time we ended up using the alpha cutout particles instead. They were also kind of a pain in the butt to implement because there was a lot of unique rules for them because they wouldn't get their color from the scene. So for example, having them work with uh, fog meant that I had to take that equation and actually put it into the injection code, or like the injection compute kernel. And also, um, uh, it's why we had to split up our post-processing, so some of it would happen before the pencil effect and some of it would happen afterwards, uh, which incurred a performance cost. Um, yeah, so good idea. Could have um, been better if we had uh, uh, more data available. All right, so how many of your graphics programmers? A fair amount, okay, how many of your artists? Also a fair amount, okay. Um, if you've ever been part of a production, maybe you can recognize this. <laughs> I will say at times it was kind of stressful. <laughs> um, so we thankfully had some pre-production on the game, and I think that is what really uh, allowed us to achieve the look we had in the end. Um, at the start, it was only me and the art director, so I had like all the, like I could focus completely on, on just trying out the various things and get something he was happy with. Um, but I also think it's like a lot of the, 
the reason why we ended up with something that worked is that uh, I was constantly in dialogue with the artist about like, well, how should we get this pipeline uh, to do the things that, uh, that you guys needed to do? Um, I would also say the artists were like really nimble to adapt to how it worked because it's, it, as you're gonna see now, it's a quite weird workflow and it was definitely something that none of us had tried to do before. So the artists have three levels of control. They have uh, globally on the camera um, where they can adjust uh, uh, variables such as the maximum and the minimum uh, brush size and how long the brush stroke should live and so on. Then they can also uh, go in and adjust it on a per material basis um, with overrides for brush type, um, brush size, and so on. And finally, there's also on the texture level a texture that in format resembles very much what's in the, the brush buffer, um, where they can go uh, and like have like the maximum amount of control. So we used Substance for uh, most of our texturing work, and it has a lot of um, advantages. You can reuse graphs. So if you create like a base wood material, you can re uh, use that to create a lot of uh, variations very quickly. Um, it also allows uh, live editing, and I think this is what was actually the most beneficial for us, because like, I, I was the only graphics programmer on this project, so I didn't have time to do some kind of like custom solution, so they could actually see how the models would look like in their 3D modeling tools, so they always had to take them into Unity to see the end results. And if we hadn't had this live, like, like, um, live editing, um, it would have taken so much longer. And I actually have an example of that. Ooh. There we go. So what you see here is uh, a substance material being edited in real time, and you can see that getting all these variables of like what directions are the strokes going in and how big are they and, and like how much boil do we have on them, like not having these uh, this exposed so you could like play around with it would have taken a lot longer time to find settings that, that works. There was also a lot of problems with them. Um, this is mainly due to the, the version of substance integration that we had to work with. Um, we had very long bake times, and it often broke on, uh, on console builds. It would also sometimes like crash the Unity editor when we imported them. And it, it actually, and then we had to, um, uh, like our tools uh, program had to spend a lot of time on developing this tool that would allow us to switch between substances and uh, baked out uh, materials um, for this, um, for, to allow us to actually uh, ship the game. So, Thankfully, there's like a new integration uh, on its way, so hopefully that should completely remove all of these problems. There was also like some um, guidelines for creating good textures. If we did something that was approaching real life, you have something that's very noisy, and that noise causes the brush strokes to change color very quickly, so you get something that flickers. But on the other hand, if you just blur all the textures, you end up with something that doesn't really have any definition and the image ends up looking really flat. So having something where you get this kind of like uh, posterized look turned out to be the best. And having a bit of like smooth gradients uh, also helped. We would also exaggerate the main form slightly so they would uh, read better uh, underneath the effect. And this is kind of like the same principles that would be used for modeling as well. Assets came in two flavors. We would have hero assets, such as uh, characters and assets that were, that were used uh, often. They would be hand-painted in a Substance Painter, whereas the rest would uh, use uh, uh, substances from Substance uh, Designer. And the good thing about those is that the only thing would have we, we needed to do was to do a correct uh, UV unwrap, and the model would be done. So, four characters and uh, other hero assets. Um, this is the, pro, uh, the process. We would do the same uh, texture uh, uh, method that you saw earlier, but we would also paint in extra highlights and shadows into the albedo map. 
to kind of make the, the characters pop uh, even more underneath, uh, below, the, below the effect. So, painting the like hero assets, um, like as you saw earlier, the format for the uh, for the brush map buffer is that's not artist friendly. So, in substance, painter the artist would uh, paint into these uh, like custom defined channels that would control the, each uh, aspect of uh, of the brush stroke. And when we then imported it into Unity, uh, a custom uh, editor. Um, script would then take all of that information and crunch it down into the texture format that uh, the pencil effect was expecting. Specifically for characters, we found that we actually needed them to pop a lot more. So we wrote this uh, kind of like highlight shader. So it is, it is, a, it is a, a normal rim light, but it actually takes the lighting in the scene into account, so it's just, uh, so, it, so the character sits more with the scene, but you still get like um, them standing out more from, uh, from the background and objects around them, which worked really well. All right, optimizations. And I think I'm doing well for time, that's good. Okay. So, um, this was the first project where I was a graphics programmer on, and I think for more experienced graphics programmers, a lot of this advice is gonna see kinda like basic, um, but in my experience, it's actually kinda hard to f uh, find uh, this stuff online and find tutorials on it. Um, so I hope it's, it's gonna be beneficial for, for people out there that there's a place where they can actually um, learn about this. So performance target-wise, we looked at um, GCN as our main uh, architecture to optimize for because it's the one used on PlayStation 4 and Xbox. We targeted uh, full HP on, um, on PlayStation 4 and 90p on Xbox. And yeah, I would advise you don't give everyone on the team uh, a 1080 graphics card because you're sitting there, and I, was, I was sitting there as the only graphics pro programmer being like, oh, we should probably start optimizing. And um, yeah. Uh, it's, we had to, to get um, about halfway through development before we started to really um, take this into, into account. Um, so for uh, optimization and for profiling, I used uh, GPU Razer quite a lot. There's other tools out there, but I really like the way that uh, it's presented. Um, I think Sony does a really good job with their tools. Um, they, um, they're easy to read. And not surprisingly, we found out that the main thing that had to be optimized was the render kernel, because in a standard HD resolution, you have around uh, two million uh, particles, or two, sorry, two million pixels. And for a given frame, we would have around uh, 30,000 strokes. So the kernel creating the strokes and updating the strokes, they were quite, like, really cheap. Like, that wasn't uh, the worry. And it also meant that um, I didn't have to worry about putting in new features into that part of the pipeline that much but anything that affected the rendering uh, had to be uh, considered quite carefully. So something that's quite easy to uh, stumble into when you're using Unity is that you're gonna uh, coupling your render thread to the main thread. And what this means is that you're not gonna be able to have your render thread like process the last frame while, while you are doing the logic for the current one. And it's a lot of it, this is not really uh, uh, that well uh, documented at the moment. Um, for example, if you um, use any of the methods in the graphics class, you're likely gonna cause, um, uh, gonna cause this uh, coupling. And the solution to, to that is actually to use uh, command buffers which is not really explained in the documentation either. It's presented as a way to extend the graphics pipeline, which is true, but if you use them, you're also making sure that all the, the commands are executed uh, on the render thread. So, scriptable render pipelines was released, uh, or like, was starting to get previewed uh, during uh, the production of 11.11, and I wish we could have switched over to it, but it was still an experimental feature. Um, so originally, um, we were uh, generating the brush map buffer uh, with replacement shaders. Uh, 
and they are terrible. <laughs> they basically causes the, the camera to call again, and you end up with, uh, with more draw calls, and you also end up causing coupling uh, with the main thread. So with scriptable render power plans, it would likely have been easier to fix this, because I would have like all the calling results uh, readily available. But I was stuck with the deferred uh, renderer, and I was also stuck with uh, a non-source uh, code version of Unity. So there was, yeah, I had to be quite creative with, with how uh, I went about solving this. So what I did is that I stole a buffer in the, in the G buffer. So normally Unity stores the uh, specular value uh, completely separate, but that's actually only constructed from a, a specular value uh, or a specularity value um, and the albedo color. So by using an unused channel to store the specularity, I freed up a whole, um, a whole buffer where I could store all, all the information that I needed. It did mean that all the lighting equations uh, got like, more expensive because that color just wasn't readily available. You had to like, recreate it for every light. But in the, in the end, we didn't have that many lights in the game anyways because we were like, concerned about having as much performance uh, reserved for the Paisley effect anyways. So this turned out to not be an issue. Um, but it did mean that all the deferred uh, lighting shaders had to be changed. Thankfully, that's something you can actually access in, um, in Unity um, quite easily, as you can see here. So it turned out to be easy. What was not so easy is that Unity has a system for um, generating shaders that work with both uh, the deferred and forward uh, render pipeline and all the lighting uh, that goes on there. But of course, they would be expecting the normal deferred uh, color layout or like buffer layout. So in order to fix that, I wrote this uh, like kind of dumb find and replace tool. Um, so I could go through the auto, like the, the generated uh, shader code and replace it. But it was not a great workflow because I had to uh, hit a button on, um, on the shader. You can actually access the, the generated uh, code um, like through scripting. So you would, I would always have to go in and uh, hit a button to show the generated code, copy it over into a separate file, and then run the patching system on that um, separate file. So yeah, was, wasn't, wasn't fun. Some objects would be forward rendered. So if we have something uh, like a, a special effect shader that were used in, in certain uh, sequences, they uh, have their own like, lighting going on. So they can be rendered as part of the regular uh, deferred pass. And this also meant that they would have to be rendered into the brush uh, buffer separately. Um, the way that uh, we would do this is that the artist would add a script to the object and instruct what uh, uh, materials should be, uh, should be used or should be, uh, should be rendered that way. And the effect would then generate a separate command buffer the, that would run after um, the deferred uh, pass was done. And that way, we would get that information into the uh, brush buffer. This also meant that I had to inject a special uh, shader pass uh, into, into the shaders, which was also taken care of by the patching system you just saw. All right, draw calls. So um, most games I've been on, draw calls in Unity is, is like something you really have to look out for. And there are more and more tricks you can use to uh, reduce them. So a fairly new thing is that you can use uh, layer call distances on the camera to uh, basically say, well, if you know that something is, is quite small, you can, use, you can call it out uh, f uh, at a shorter distance than the, the far clip plane of the camera. Um, we would also combine meshes when uh, necessary. And Unity's static batching is, is quite temperamental, so it also took our artists a lot of uh, diligence and experimentation to make sure that we had everything batching as much as uh, possible. So occlusion calling is also something that sometimes led to like better performance, sometimes not. So we would test it on a level by level basis if we, we should uh, have that enabled. So data packing is um, a pretty, pretty cool technique. Um, what this allows is that you can fit uh, more, uh, more information into uh, less space. In our case, we used it for 
uh, fitting more strokes uh, into, uh, into LDS, and we also reduced the amount of uh, VRAM that the effect required, which was basically freed up uh, like texture space for the rest of, uh, of the rendering. So it can also uh, increase, increase performance because you have uh, less data that has to be uh, loaded from uh, VRAM. So there's like less uh, um, data that has to be transferred over. It does increase ALU pressure, so it's easy to make sure that you actually test to see if this is actually gonna like, be more performant than uh, not having it in. The good thing is that it's very easy to implement because you're only looking at the, the spots in your code where you are reading and writing your data out. So it's something that's not gonna have like, repercussions for the rest of your logic. And HLSL uh, supplies uh, F16 to FT2 and uh, reverse that allows you to, to do this uh, packing uh, of two floats into one float. Um, but of course, the lack of precision can't be an issue. So there was like some of some of the information, such as the position, where we just couldn't use this. For optimizing ALU and uh, VGPR um, usage, I used these two talks from uh, uh, Emil Pearson, uh, aka uh, Humus. Um, they're really good. It's like super concrete and easy to to use advice, and. In our specific case, uh, using ISP, which is an uh, approximation of, uh, of division, uh, turned out to be uh, really beneficial in a lot of cases. Uh, SYNCOS is also um, a lot uh, more uh, efficient than doing uh, SYN and COS uh, separately. All of these are HLSL intrinsic functions that are readily available. Um, I also found that pre-computing part of the intersection math um, and then have that uh, available in a constant buffer, um, led to a nice speed up. And we would also pre-compute the aspect and inverse aspect radio um, for use in, in other parts of uh, the pipeline. And this is the aspect radio of the, the brush strokes. So, a nice feature in Unity is that you can actually see the generated bytecode by just uh, uh, finding the shader in, uh, in the editor and clicking this button. And what that allows you to do is to compare if changes to your shader is actually gonna change the amount of, um, of instructions that, that you generate, which when it takes like maybe 20 minutes to do a build, this can very quickly add up to a lot of uh, time, time gained. Something you can also do on uh, some platforms is to use platform-specific uh, defines to uh, basically nudge the, the compiler to, to optimize your shader in uh, different ways. Um, it's, not it's not available on, on, all, on everything, but uh, uh, yeah, um, for the consoles, that can be, uh, be a benefit as well. So when you're starting out learning uh, compute uh, shaders, quite often people will use structs, um, and it's, it, they're terrible. <laughs> um, it's way better to use uh, a, a structure of arrays instead of an array of uh, structs, and the reason for that is that um, you get better cache coherency, and each kernel can load in the data it, uh, it needs itself. Like, for example, for all the culling that we do, we don't need the color of the, bro of the brush stroke, so there's no reason to have that uh, sticking around. Um, and I, this is a guess, and maybe someone in the audience will know this, but I also think that the compiler can rearrange the code so ALU instructions can happen uh, while memory fetches are, are also being done. And if it's done as, as like one big fetch uh, of, of a struct, I think that's a lot harder for the compiler to, um, to schedule. So what you're seeing here is the debug view that I use the most, and this is the content of uh, each uh, calling tile. So if you see a, a pixel in there, that is because um, a brush stroke has been determined to be inside that, uh, that calling tile. And something that uh, worked really well in terms of optimizing the effect without uh, like a visual uh, loss of quality was to actually look at how many strokes are inside the calling tile and then feed that back into the generation kernel. So 
if, um, if it, the tile was starting to fill up, the uh, probability of new strokes spawning would be reduced. So what's going on with all the green and blue colors? Well, it's quite often that a stroke will not cover all the, the pixels in a 32 by 32 uh, tile. So that basically means that if um, that you, you, you end up like with a, a lot of the threads not doing anything. And on GCN, uh, eight by eight pixels is actually the optimal size for, uh, for uh, a work group. But that puts a lot of uh, limitations on how much you can actually fit into your uh, local data share. Yeah. So, you might think like, okay, can we reduce the size of the calling tiles? And unfortunately, testing showed that if, um, if they're smaller than 32 by 32 pixels, they started being, being slower. So what I did instead is that I would keep the calling, uh, the fine calling uh, at 32 uh, pixels, but I would then actually run um, three different uh, render kernels after each other each optimized for a different amount of uh, strokes in that calling tile. And I did this first as like a quick um, test to see if the approach would work out. I thought I would have to do some kind of like quick uh, clever scheduling, but it turns out it was actually like really, really fast. So what happens is that um, the, the render kernel that's optimized for eight by eight pixels will look at how um, how many strokes are in the tile, and if it's not fitting the amount that it can fit into LDS, it will early out. And because all the threads in the work uh, group are earlying out, it's, um, it's very quick to do this. So on average, um, executing um, a render kernel that wouldn't actually affect anything in the image would only take uh, 90 uh, microseconds. And I thought this was kind of be like a golden, uh, or like I guess it's a silver bullet. Yeah, silver bullet to, uh, performance, but it turns out it was only a 0 0.7 uh, millisecond uh, gain we had from it, but that's still, still nice. All right, so now I'm going to talk a bit about uh, future improvements and a conclusion. So one drawback of using um, substances is that they wouldn't, be, uh, they wouldn't take the topology of an object into account. So for example, these uh, like, uh, floorboards you see here, you would actually need smaller strokes on the thinner sides of the boards than on the rest of them. And in order to allow the artist to, to fix this, um, I actually had time to put in vertex painting of, uh, of brush sizes uh, into the, the whole pipeline but it came online so late, so we didn't end up uh, using it in the end. Unity is doing a lot of amazing things at the moment. Um, scriptal render pipelines uh, is uh, one of them. And if we had, uh, had had access to that, it would have helped with a lot of issues. Um, we could have had uh, lit uh, injected strokes because uh, in their uh, high definition render pipeline, all of that information is readily available. I guess it will be available in the lightweight one as well. And the ability to create and bind buffers uh, more freely um, would have meant that I would have a lot more like, flexibility in what I would have been able to do. Um, something that we saw at the end of the project is because the, the brush uh, stroke uh, the brush sizes are in, an, in a single 8-bit um, channel. That means that it's a normalized value. And if we needed to, to go in and change the, uh, like make, make some big strokes, for example, in one scene, we would have to do that on, on the global level, which meant that all the materials had to be, uh, had to be tweaked because it was like all coupled together. So in the future, I, I would store all of this in a 16-bit um, uh, half precision value instead, so you don't have that coupling between all the brush sizes. Um, that would have saved our lead artist a lot of time uh, in the end. So nowadays you have to make sure that your game is easy to share uh, and 
we found that YouTube compression was very tough on the effect. It took us a couple of tries uh, in recording uh, footage for, for trailers before we really got a, got a hang of it. Um, and it's, it's, it's such a shame, right? Because when people actually see the game in, in real life, they, they can see the, the texture that you get from having uh, uh, the, the brush strokes there, whereas a lot of it is kind of like washed out if you're watching it on a phone. Um, that said, I'm, I'm really proud of what we achieved. So what you're seeing here is uh, a, a piece of concept art uh, from early in development. And this is the scene um, that you see at the start of the game, especially like the way that the like, lampposts are like, having this like, nice halo around them and how um, dreamy looking the, the background is. Um, I think that's really nice. And you can also see it uh, here with like other other scenes in the game, like having this sense of a um, of a not that defined uh, background, like rushing past you, for example, when you're playing with the pigeon, is uh, is something that um yeah I think looks really beautiful. So here at the end of the talk, I would also like to thank uh, uh, a bunch of different people. I got a lot of uh, mentoring uh, throughout the project from a bunch of very talented uh, graphics programmers. Um, we also got a lot of help from the Unity Spotlight team with uh, figuring out some of the various ways to uh, tweak the deferred pipeline to do what we, uh, what we needed it to do. Um, and I would also like to thank uh, Cody, the lead artist on the game, for helping out with uh, preparing uh, the, uh, some of the slides in, in this talk. And lastly, I would also like to thank Artman and um, Band on Amco for allowing me to uh, give this talk in, uh, in the end. So I would also like to thank the rest of the team that I worked with at Artman. Um, I think everyone was, was uh, doing a, a really good job, but like, maybe even more importantly, there was, it's also one of the teams I've been on where we had the best uh, social interactions, like everyone was gelling really well and it, it meant that it was just a, a pleasure to, to work on this game. Um, yeah, it's, it's one of the best projects I've been involved in. All right. So to conclude on all, all of this, pre-production is really a must if you're trying to do something that is um, as weird as, as we try to uh, achieve. Um, and it's important that the technology has a head start uh, before the rest of production uh, ramps up. Also, talk to your artists and make sure that what you're developing is actually uh, what they need. Um, all the disciplines have to, to work together in order to, uh, to achieve the look that you want. Compute traders have a huge potential for, photo, or for, like, um, for painstly rendering, and I can't wait to see what's going to be done with them uh, in the future. And thankfully, I would say uh, be a novice when you start, because then there's a lot of uh, easy <laughs> things you can fix at the end of the project to uh, increase your performance. All right, that's it. So there's microphones uh, set up if you want to ask me questions. Um, I'll, I can't actually see the microphone from here, but uh, I guess if you form a line, uh, that'll work. And remember to say uh, where you're from when you ask the question. Hey, that was a beautiful presentation. Really awesome work. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question. How did the, uh, how did the artist author the flow directions? So that was um, that was by painting uh, like regular flow maps in uh, in Substance Painter and also having uh, custom notes for it when um, it was in Substance Designer. I think um, if you meet us in the wrap up room, uh, Cody is actually here and he can uh, yeah, he's sitting right there. Okay. <laughs> um, he can he, he can answer uh, more specifically how that worked. Right. Thanks. Do we have any more? Yes. Uh, I asked about the, the feature about 
because I look, it's look the static, the static image, I think it's very beautiful. But what when the camera is moving, and then we can figure out that uh, the paint, the stroke is like a little bit flickering because they are keep appearing and disappearing. So is that the final effect that the artist expect, or you try to mo Sorry, make it more yeah, stable? Could you, could you try and rephrase that? I mean, for the dynamic scene, you will find that uh, the stroke is keep appearing and disappearing far away or something like that. Is this the final effect that the artist uh, expected? Uh, so if I'm understanding you correctly, you're asking if artist ex was Expect expecting the effect to behave as it did? Yes, because you, you create a game with some concept art that is just static, right? Yeah. It's very beautiful, and the static scene. Oh, I see what you mean. So in motion, was it like yeah. what we were trying to go for? Yeah. So um, our art director actually made a, a kind of like a sizzle reel of uh, things he wanted the effect to do uh, early on, and a lot of that was inspired by, um, actually, I actually think I have a, a slide for that, yeah. So we would look at something like uh, The Old Man and the Sea, okay. which is a really beautiful oil-painted animation, and he had eight different things that he wanted to see in the pencil effect. Some of them yeah, was not really achievable, but something like boil and, um, like slurring, like some of that stuff we, we, we kind of got in. Um, so I think early on, like that dialogue with him is really what informed how the effect looked in the end. Um, I think there was definitely a learning curve for the artist in order to figure out how to create the 3D art that would work because they couldn't like just look at it inside uh, 3D Max. They would have to export it into the game engine and then fiddle around with it. But we, could, we definitely saw like at the end of the production, they had a lot easier time creating assets quickly um, because they had a, a huge uh, library of substances to rely on and they just knew the whole uh, effect uh, much better. Okay, thank you. All right. Hello, great talk, thank you. Uh, did you explore machine learning style transfer to perform this effect? So, uh, I th is the question to you if I will use machine learning? Did you explore the possibility of using style transfer? Uh, oh, do you mean the one? Uh, no, um, we didn't use any machine learning uh, for this. So, if we had used machine learning, the problem with that is that you, you give up a lot of control for how easy it, it is to use. And as you can see here, we had a lot of uh, artist control over specific objects and uh, the scene as a whole. So if we had used um, like machine learning, I, f it, I think we would have kind of like thought what that approach would have given us. So I'm seeing some quite interesting approaches uh, at GDC this year where they have uh, like used it, but they also bill it as a way to prototype a, as a given look. And I think that it's gonna be interesting to see if we're gonna end up with like some kind of hybrid approach where we, we will have like some parameters that are, are controlled. But what I'm seeing, seeing from using machine learning so far is that it, it is like, it's kind of like a take it or leave it situation. Uh, you either use it or you don't. Okay, see. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello. So you mentioned a lot of uh, in the talk about troubles with Unity and all that. Um, could you go into why Unity was chosen for a project over maybe Unreal or a custom engine? Yeah, that's a good question. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm happy. I'm a Unity <laughs> freelancer, so I think it was predominantly because Admin has used it for uh, like other problems, uh, other other problems, <laughs> other projects in the past. Um, so. It's, there was a lot of um, like institutional knowledge on how to use the engine, and I think for the size of team we were, it was also a, a fairly good fit. Um, so I, I have only worked a little bit with Unreal, so this is kind of like hearsay, but what I've uh, heard is that if you have to modify their renderer, like you have to delve, like you basically have to write in C++ and like, tear out things and like put things uh, back together. Whereas Unity is much more, and I guess this is kind of like a, an engine design philosophy. They use, um, um, they, they approach it much more like a toolbox 
Um, and there's like, you have to build more on top, but it's kind of designed that way. Um, and there, there are limitations of how far you can go with that when you're using uh, the current deferred uh, or forward renderer. But what they're doing now with the SRP and the whole DOT system, you're gonna see that like, it's, go it's probably gonna be a lot quicker to do all of these things. Um, so yeah, that's, that's why we ended up with Unity. I see, thank you. I think we have one more. I think. <laughs> that's it, okay. All right, well, uh, thank you for coming, and um, remember to fill out uh, evaluations uh, afterwards. All right, enjoy what's left of the decision. <laughs>